Okay, so let's continue uh, the discussion on algorithms and optimization. So by now you should know what is an algorithm, what is the optimization problem, uh, of course, very uh, introductory level. And then uh, for the optimization problem, we studied um, unconstrained optimization and constrained optimization. How can we translate a constrained optimization to an unconstrained one and then find the solutions? And then in this chapter, what we are trying to do is uh, trying to uh, discuss uh, some mathematical foundations. These mathematical foundations help you to um, get the basic techniques to help you to, to uh, find solutions for the optimization and for the algorithms that, that we are going to discuss later in the, in, in the course. Okay, um, we actually briefly touched upon uh, in chapter one on the convexity. So convexity is a specific definition, something that uh, you should know. Um, it, it's actually straightforward. So convexity, convex, we call convex domain is a line linking any two points in the domain should remain in the domain. So any, any points in within that domain, if you draw a line between those two points, it should remain in the domain. What does that mean? It essentially says that if I have one point here, I might use some text actually, oh, hold on. No. Uh, draw a line, okay. So um, let's use uh, red in this case. So now if I draw a line from one point to the other, what do you say, it's still within the specific domain, right? This In this um, solid circle um, domain, if I draw any two line, any, if I draw a line linking any two points, it should remain in the line, agree? This is apparently is a convex domain. How about this one? Isn't that the same? Any two points should stay, continue to stay within the domain. How about this one? It's the same, right? Yes, that's correct. How about the one on the right? Those two, it's not called convex domain, essentially means there might, might be something that's violating this condition. This looks okay, this looks okay, how about this? Not everything on the line stays in the domain, right? So in this type of um, domain, we call it concave domains. This looks fine, looks fine but not this, apparently. So that is um, definition of convex versus concave. Let's look at convex set. A set S in an n-dimensional space is called a convex set. If for any two points, X and Y in S, we have this particular relationship saying that using a theta x plus one minus theta y still belongs to the set. It's actually um, um, very mathematical, meaning that if you have a vector of x and a vector of y, and then the, um, the, uh, the addition of those two vectors still belongs to that set. Then that is called convex set. Okay, which is the definition of the convex set. And then uh, just be aware that theta should be either zero or one. And then convex function. A function fx defined on a convex set omega is called 
convex uh, function if f alpha x plus beta y less than equal to alpha fx plus beta fy. And for any x, y in the convex set, and then alpha larger than equal to zero, beta larger than equal to zero, and alpha plus beta equal to one. So that's convex function. We will have some examples to show you to understand what this meant. Of course, you might be wondering why do we need this? Then it's really that because certain conditions for this convexity have to be met in order you can in order to find the optimal solution for optimization problems. Okay, I have to um Um, so let's say um, this example. I want you to show that fx is x squared minus y is convex. We can show that the inequality always hold for any x and y so that um, alpha x plus beta y squared minus one, so which is f alpha x plus beta, plus beta y should be less than or equal to alpha times fx plus beta times fy. If you go back to the uh, definition um, on the previous page, you can see f alpha x plus beta y less than this plus beta fy. So now we put that in. Now we want to prove whether this is the case. Um, assuming it is true, and let's rearranging the inequality. What essentially you do is, you know, you expand this, and then expand those two, and then uh, minus, move this to the left hand side, move this to the right hand side, and do some uh, rearranging. You come back with this uh, equation. So for this equation, it's equivalent to expanding this section, uh, this, this set, and then you come back to here, and then you take out the factor of alpha, you use alpha times y minus alpha times x minus y squared, you can come back with this relationship. This is larger than or equal to zero, uh, just because we said alpha beta larger than or equal to zero, but also squared larger than or equal to zero, so that we know this is larger than or equal to zero. Because this is larger than or equal to zero, so we know this is larger than or equal to zero, so that we know this relationship holds, meaning which is always true. So the inequality is true, and fx is indeed convex. So the inequality is true, meaning this inequality is true, and so that we can, we can prove that fx is convex. It's a convex function. So property of convex functions, if f1 and f2 are convex, the linear combination of those two functions are convex as well. You use alpha beta larger than or equal to zero, alpha times f1 plus beta times x2, alpha times f1 plus beta times f2 is also convex. That's the first property. Second property, if f1, f2, and fn are convex, then max of all of these functions is also convex. Straightforward, right? The next one, if fx and gx are convex, then f of gx is convex under non-decreasing conditions. For example, um, exponential fx is convex if fx is convex. So that is to say if fx is convex, we know exponential x 
or exponential y is convex as well. So that um, as long as exponential y is non-decreasing, then we know exponential fx is convex because we know exponential function is not decreasing so that we know exponential fx is convex is if fx is convex so those are three properties of convex foundations of uh, functions as you are aware i'm not giving you proof to any of the properties or all the theory that's a key point i'm trying to tell you that is we we get into certain depths of mass, but we didn't actually go all the way to the uh, very deep in mass, because sometimes you have to leverage the theorem, theorem output rather than try to prove the um, theory. I think proving the theory is important, but sometimes it can be very um, uh, tedious for a lot of you, the reason uh, that I kind of skip and also the reason that the textbook is valuable is because it to some certain point has some mass, but you really don't need to get into too much of the weights of the mass. So next, next concept that we want to discuss is computational complexity. If you studied uh, any computer science or algorithms course, you would know that this is this is foundation for a lot of algorithms. So um, what, is, what, what is computational complexity? Let's, before we move on, we use this other notation. The main notation in complex, complexity theory is order notation big O. For, for a given problem size n, big O n squares means that the calculation takes the order of n squared algebra, algebraic operations. So both 10 times n squared plus 100 and 5 times n squared are the same order of big O n squared um, complexity if n is usually large. Okay, this is an example. Let's look at a specific example. The multiplication of 2n times n square matrices A and B has a complexity of a big O notation of n cubed. So um, you might be wondering why, right? So let's take a look at the product of C, a, a product of A and B, which is C. C equal to A product B has n by n entries, right? Because a is n by n, b is n by n, as a product output of matrices, it should be n by n. And each entry is the sum of the product of um, the row a and the column of b, which requires n multiplications and n minus one sums. So here you, you realize what, what we're saying, right? For uh, if I use a text here, no, maybe not. If you remember that for A, yeah. what you do is you use one row times a column of the B, each, each element, element-wise multiplication, and then add them up. That would be the output of your first element of your um, C matrix. So it requires n multiplications because A has n, the first row has n elements. This first row n elements times first column of that n, n um, elements, it's um, n multi multiplications, right? And then each ele element wise, each one times the other one plus the second one times the second one, so that it's n mult multiplications. And then after that multiplication, you add them up, it's n minus one sums. Therefore, the complexity of obtaining one entry of O of C is big O N because we have N multiplications and N minus one sums in there. So the total number of algebra, algebraic operations is, because we know it's an by N matrix, 
is each each element we get is uh, big O n. So it's big O n times n by n. The big O n cubed, um, n cubed computational complexity for this um, matrix multiplication. The other notation for complexity mainly concerns the approximate number of cal calculations. It does not represent the actual computational time that may largely depend on the speed of the computer, implementation details, for example, vectorization, which is done in R and in MATLAB, in Python, in many of the languages. The programming language used architecture or Architecture, we meant parallelization, cloud computing, and other factors such as the underlying operation system and other running algorithms. All of this would impact the computational time. But here we are really talking about mathematically what is the computational complexity. That's a big old um, notation or some other, other notations as well. There's one set of problem that is called NP-hard problem. So let's take a look at what is NP-hard problem. You might have heard of this, especially in combina uh, combinatorial optimization. If you ever learn, uh, learn, uh, heard of uh, travel, traveler salesman problem, which is, stands for TSP. And then for traveler salesman problem, it's an NP-hard problem. So let's say what is NP-hard and what is P. So uh, let's talk about P first. For class P type of problem, it's defined as if a problem can be solved by a Turing machine, a computer in polynomial time, then we see its complexity is big O n powered by K where n is a problem size, k is the order, and this type of problem is called class P problem. So it says that all of this problem can be solved in poly polynomial time on a computer. And these, most of these cases, this problem considered to be easy, and, but it does not mean that they can be solved quickly in practice. Essentially saying that it just can be solved. We know it's easy to be solved. It's just a matter of time it will be solved. That type of problem, we call it class P problem. For example, that we just said, multiplication is big O n cubed and inverse of a matrix is big O cubed as well. If n is 10 power by six, the complexity n, uh, o, big O n cubed is big O 10 powered by 18, which can take a very long time. So for a computer with Intel Core on i7, it has about 150 times 10 power by flops or 150 gigaflops, which means that it requires um, around these many seconds, which is around 77 days to solve this problem. It takes time to solve, but we know eventually it will be solved. So this is some, something that we call it polynomial time class P type of problem. So what is class NP, non-deterministic polynomial time? Then you'll know it's not going to be solved in polynomial time. So it's some sort of problem that's difficult to solve because the time tends to increase exponentially with problem size. Um, I just talked about traveler's salesman problem, which is TSP of visiting each of the N cities exactly once. The number of possible combinations is N, Q, N, N factorial for 100 cities is 9.3 um, 9 times 10 power by 157. This number is really big. It takes much longer than the age of the universe by all computers in the world to try all combinations. So many of the problems in data mining and machine learning could be long to class NP, non-polynomial type of problem, it's a difficult problem. So before I, we move on, actually I do want to show you 
what is um, what is um, um, travel to the salesman problem. So let me use this space. So if we have a couple of cities, so for UPS, there's no means that the bigger the dots, it means anything. So the UPS travelers in the morning, the delivery guy make a, need to make a decision on which are the cities that, which are the address that I, I need to go and then in what order. So this is a problem called traveler's salesman problem. So for example, this is a UPS store. Let's assume this is a UPS store. So we want to start from here. The, the, the driver wants to start from there and then start making a tour, right? Here, and then uh, let me use a different color. Goes there first and then there and then there to visit all of the cities and then come back. This would be one solution. There could be some other solutions, right? It could start from, <clears throat> let's use a different color, <clears throat> could make a decision, on, okay, I go there first and then go there and then I make a decision to go there. That's the second solution. I visit all the addresses because I need to deliver something there and then I come back to the depot. That's class NP, now one of the example, traveler salesman problem. You can see that if it's 100, you have to have 100 factorial possible combinations. It take a lot of time to solve. Of course, there are a lot of heuristics to help you to avoid the fact that you need to go through all of the solutions, all of the possible solutions. So that's NP hard type of problem. Okay. Norms. This is the definition. So a solution to an n-dimensional optimization problem is represented by a column vector. <laughs> that is x is x1, x2, all the way xn transpose, which is a column vector x1 all the way to xn. So if you remember that for, for the problem that we discussed in chapter one, x and y essentially is this vector, right? x1 is x, x2 is y, so that our solution is basically what that x and y is. And then uh, we want to define something called LP norm or P norm. P norm of a vector is, is defined this way. It is um, x1 determinant powered by P plus x2 determinant powered by P um, all the way and then sum them up powered by one, uh, one over P. Uh, and then it's um, in the compact form. This is sum of all of them xi, absolute value powered by p, sum them up, one over p, p larger than zero. So commonly used norms are p equal to two, is something called Cartesian or Euclidean. You probably know this, it's distance, right? And then p equal to one and p equal to infinity. Let's look at p equal to two. The p equal to two, two norm or LP, L2 norm is square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus all the way xn squared. Just every single one squared and then sum them up and take the square root of the sum. P equal to one is something called Manhattan distance or Manhattan norm. It's x1 absolute value plus x2 absolute value all the way add, up, add them up. And the x infinity norm equal to max of x1 absolute value, x2 absolute value, and all the way xn. So this is called maximum norm. Let's take a look at this example. <clears throat> 
for the vector, a specific set of numbers, five numbers. Its norms are for second uh, x2, norm two, right? A two norm is square root of this is 12. And then, of course, we have the uh, L1 and L infinity. Now it's an exercise, you should use R to calculate the different norms of a vector. Okay, so, um, so the graph is really just give you a, graphical representation of L norm. Uh, P norm, L, LP norm or P norm, yeah. And then um, this um, red square is P equal to one and blue is P equal to two and then um, green is P equal to infinity. This would be used in the um, some, uh, some of the variation of the data mining algorithms. For example, uh, you, you probably heard of linear regression, but you, uh, if you remember, there are some um, LP norm type of con um, constraints, uh, type of penalty terms that will be added to the objective function of linear regression. Uh, we're going to discuss this very shortly in next next chapter, I believe, so that you just remember this concepts or definition for now. And then this is how it looks like when P equal to four and P equal to um, a half as well on the right hand side. Eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This is from um, linear algebra, I would say, right? Yes, linear algebra. So for, for square real matrix A, stands for A sub IJ, so A11, A12 all the way to A1N, and AN1 and AN2 all the way to ANN. It's eigenvalue, eigenvalue lambda, and its corresponding eigenvector mu are given by A times U equal to lambda times U. So for the matrix, U is the eigenvector, and lambda is the eigenvalue which can, can be calculated by determinant of a minus lambda i equal to zero, zero. So the way that was done is um, do some sort of um, manipulation of the original uh, relationship. A times mu equal to lambda times mu. Um, so um, you, you can find that uh, in, order to in order to find um, the corresponding lambda and mu, you can you can use determinant of a minus lambda r equal to zero to find the eigenvalue and eigenvectors. Since a has a size of n by n, there are usually n eigenvalues. We use lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, all the way to lambda n to represent those different eigenvalues. And then n corresponding eigenvectors as well, it's a ui, U, u1, u2, all the way to un. Although the eigenvalues may not always be distinct. So we know we have n eigenvalues, n eigenvectors, but there's a possibility that the n eigenvalues are not distinct. This would be useful when we do uh, analysis on uh, an algorithms such as uh, um, clustering and dimension reduction. When we do the dimension reduction, when we do the clustering, we do need to um, take a look at the uh, eigenvalue and eigenvectors. Properties of eigenvalues. If the eigenvalue of A are lambda I, and then eigen, eigenvalues of A powered by K, or lambda I powered by K, where K is a positive integer, um, for this, for this, uh, for this definition, so you just be aware that 
if you know if uh, all the lambda i's are the eigenvalues, then the eigenvalues of the original matrix time powered by k are the, are the um, eigenvalues of original matrix powered by k are the eigenvalue of original matrix, which is lambda i, and then powered by k. That is the one of the property that you should be aware. A definition. If all the eigenvalues lambda i are of square symmetric A are all positive, that is that is to say all of the lambda i's are larger than zero, and then the matrix is called positive definite. And then if one of them is less than zero, then A is negative definite. So we can leverage eigenvalues to define the original, original uh, matrix. In general, if all lambda i larger than or equal to zero, A is positive, positive semi-definite. And then conversely, if all of them are less than or equal to zero, we call it negative semi-definite. So these are purely those three are uh, definition. So for example, uh, this seven, uh, this matrix A has an eigenvalue of four and 10. You could use a uh, determinant of A minus lambda I. I is a uh, indicate identity matrix equal to zero to get the um, eigenvalues of uh, four and 10 for A. And then for B, you have eigenvalues of negative four and 10. And then just because the definition, we know if both of them are positive, we say that A is a positive definite. And then for B, because one of them is um, um, negative, the other one is positive, so that we cannot say it's positive definite or negative definite. It's just, it's just not, right? Because one of them is negative, the other one is positive. So as an exercise, you can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a three by three matrix using R. Okay, uh, I'll stop here because anything that we are going to discuss after this point is a little bit slightly different from what we just discussed. So we discussed what is convex, what is a, a P class problem, what is NP class problem, and then um, what is LP norm, and uh, um, also um, what is uh, big O notation complexity, and uh, what is eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, well, I'll stop here for now and I'll come back. Thank you.